I appreciate everyone being here. Um, I'm Joe Flynn. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Norton Medical Group and the Physician in Chief of the Cancer Institute. Um, welcome to the 27th Gail Klein Garlove Lectureship. We're glad you joined us tonight for the past, present, future of the adolescent and young adult oncology movement. Um, this lectureship wouldn't be possible without the generous gift of the Garlove family and their friends and really on this ongoing education program in the honor of Gail Klein Garlove. Um, she was a really a, a, an incredible lady from what I understand. She's a dedicated mother, community-minded volunteer, really selfless individual, always willing to give whatever she had for the benefit of others. Strong woman who fought a courageous battle against colon cancer but unfortunately lost the battle in 1994. We're gonna start off with a video that gives you a glimpse into the history of the Garlow Lectureship and the generosity of, of this wonderful family. Gail Klein Garlove was a Louisville woman known for her friendly smile, generous nature, and volunteer spirit. Tragically, her life was cut short by colon cancer ahead of her 55th birthday, but Gail's loved ones vowed that Gail and the goodness she represented would not be forgotten, which led to a lecture series. Who could have foreseen that out of the tragedy of this uh, young woman's death and her family's trauma, that something this exciting and positive could happen. Medical oncologist Dr. Tom Woodcock cared for Gail through her colon cancer journey at Norton Cancer Institute. And when her family wanted to honor her memory in a special way, Dr. Woodcock stepped up in 1995 as the founding physician of the Garlov Lectureship. It's important to understand that the uh, lectureship was different. This wasn't just having some traveling expert come to Louisville with a box of slides. They were interested in trying to raise knowledge, not just in the professional community, but in the community at large. It's because of the Garlove family's generous contributions through the Norton Healthcare Foundation that Norton Cancer Institute has been able to provide for decades this free annual educational event for medical professionals and the public. As the Garlove family continues to grow, so does the lectureship it started so many years ago. I remember when it first started, uh, we were at the uh, Norton Hospital downtown and it was in a auditorium and there were probably 20 people there the first evening and most of those people were there because Dr. Woodcock went out into the hallway and said we're having a lectureship tonight will you please come. Each year the event attracts hundreds of people from across the community from doctors to patients to community members as they listen to and learn from nationally recognized physicians about the latest and most innovative cancer treatments. Early on we had so many people that were struggling with cancer. They were in treatment. They wanted to find out what options they had. And so being able to give them that information at a level that they could understand as far as does this relate to your specific type of cancer and are you a candidate for this rather than which chemical tracer they're, they're looking to track. You know, it's good to have that information, but it's also to know, good to know how does this directly impact me as I'm struggling to deal with cancer. Fighting cancer takes a village. This event aims to empower the whole community through education because everyone deserves to be armed with knowledge, especially when it comes to one's health. I think the lectureship is such a great example of that, of bringing the clinical world together with the community and saying, look, we're in this together. It's no different than our care model. And um, it's really beautiful to see. Before we go any further, I want to just take a moment and introduce you to the Garlove family. Over here we have uh, Lee Garlove and Dr. Amy Garlove and Addison and Emery. So let's give them a round of applause. And over here we have, over here we have um, Matt and Dana. Garlove, sorry. And, and really just because of your guys' generosity, obviously we've been able to impact so many patients and, and educators and clinicians and really made a huge impact in the name of your mom. And um, I, I know I speak for a lot of us when I, I want to say thank you and very, very grateful for your commitment to continuing this legacy. So thank you very much. 
it's really a distinct honor for me tonight to introduce our speaker. Um, we, were, we were talking beforehand, um, um, Dr. Hayes Latt and I, we met in 2006, and um, I've been able to watch the great things that he's done in the field of adolescent and young adult cancer since that time. And, and I'll, I'll go through the things I'll read because he's got a pretty impressive background, but um, the impact he's had on a discipline that really, in, before 2006, really wasn't something that we even talked about. We didn't differentiate. We said, you're either a kid or you're an adult. And um, the impact he's had has really shaped more lives than we can even count. So I'm really thrilled that he uh, agreed to come out and, and, and speak with us. Um, Brandon serves as professor of medicine and medical director in the division of hematology, malignant, uh, pardon me, medical oncology at the Oregon Health and Sciences University. And he's the medical director of the Knight Cancer Institute's adolescent young adult oncology program. His clinical background is in the management of hematologic malignancies and the use of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Um, as a young adult cancer survivor himself and a physician caring for many young adults with hematologic malignancies, Dr. Hayes Latin has taken a leadership role in the development of the discipline of AYA oncology and really, as I said, moving it from just a concept to being something where we really consider and it's really changed how we care for young people uh, with cancer. He served as a senior medical advisor to the Live Strong Foundation, the chief medical officer for Critical Mass, which is uh, the Young Adult Cancer Alliance, the inaugural chair of the AYA Committee for SWOG. He's participated on the expert advisory panel to the Children's Oncology Group AYA Committee and was a member of the CDC's Federal Advisory Committee on Breast Cancer in Young Women. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brandon Hayes Latin to Louisville and the Garlove Lectureship. Brandon. Thank you so much. Uh, what a real honor to be here. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation, Dr. Flynn, and again, want to thank the Garla family. Um, uh, th I think that video really does sum up sort of the intersection between uh, you know, the, the medical professionals who are trying to advance the field, but the patients and community that make it all happen. And hopefully I'll tell you a bit of a story tonight about um, how various groups came together to tackle a problem around adolescent and young adult cancer. Because uh, as Dr. Flynn said, when we met, uh, this really wasn't a thing. Um, so my, my goal today is to kind of give you the history, the, the past, present, and the future of adolescent and young adult oncology. What I hope you'll get out of it is uh, that you'll be able to identify some of the health outcome gaps and the continuing trends in those gaps that led us to focus on this unique population that's not little kids and not older patients, but in between. Um, I'm gonna try to provide you with some examples of some impactful interventions uh, in the clinical care of adolescents and young adult patients uh, to reduce those outcome gaps. Uh, and then I'll discuss a little bit about the need for AYA oncology education and this kind of collaboration between patients and providers across a variety of specialties. So I'm going to take you back to when Dr. Flynn and I actually met uh, in the sort of early 2000s. Uh, some folks started to look at data like this. It's kind of a complicated slide, but what this is showing you is the five-year survival rate uh, after a diagnosis of cancer based on the age at which you were diagnosed. And so on the left part of the screen, you see age five to nine. If you were a child diagnosed in 1975, your five-year survival was about 55%, but you can see every five-year interval, it got better such that if you were a child diagnosed in 1995, the five-year survival rate was about 80%. If you look at the other end of the screen, if you were diagnosed as an older patient between ages 65 and 69, while the absolute five-year survival percentage was lower, you can see that with each five-year interval, we were getting better and better and making improvements in the survival rate. But what struck people was in the middle. If you were an adolescent and young adult, if you were age 25 to 29 diagnosed with cancer, while your absolute survival level was pretty high, there was no improvement over that period of time. And that lack of improvement was one of the things that a group of us said, you know, we really need to examine. 
And it wasn't that those young adults had reached the pinnacle, that we were, as a field, never going to have a survival rate greater than 75%, because as you can see from the pediatric graph, they had exceeded that survivorship. So that was one piece of data that said, you know, maybe we should look at what's happening with this in-between age range. This is a sort of a famous graph in the field of adolescent and young adult, which looks at the interval change in five-year survival rate over time. And again, you can see for younger patients and for older patients, really every year about one and a half or two percent improvement in five-year survival rate was happening. But between about 15 and 39, there was this gap of improvement. If you start to look at some of the cancers that might occur in adolescents and young adults, you'll see data like this. This is a survival curve where at time zero, 100% of patients are alive, but as you go over time, you can see that, that um, the number of patients still alive drops off. And uh, it's kind of a busy slide, but the younger you are with a diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the more likely you're going to be a long-term survivor. And that's maybe not a surprise. There's a lot of health conditions where younger patients are going to do better than older patients because of comorbidities and things like that. But there's a really dramatic change here. And really, that dramatic change kind of happens around age 15. So um, the, the long-term survival rate for ALL above the age of 15 was less than 30%. Um, less than half of the long-term survival rate for children. So something clearly different was happening for young adults. And this is looking at a different cancer in the opposite end of the age spectrum. This is looking at survivorship in breast cancer, where we actually see the opposite trend. So if you're a woman diagnosed with breast cancer at the time, your five-year survival rate was actually worse the younger you were below age 40. So a younger patient actually has a worse five-year survival. And that's true whether a patient presented with localized disease just in the breast, with regional disease that had spread to the lymph nodes, or with distant metastatic disease. So a group of folks got together. Uh, including patient advocates, including researchers at the National Cancer Institute. And we all said, well, what's going on in this 15 to 40 year age range? Because that's where we were seeing these survival gaps. And maybe we should study that. And others came to us and said, 15 to 40, that is a huge age range. Why would you choose that? In fact, I, I had to give a lecture in Europe once defending the United States definition of adolescent and young adult as 15 to 40. Um, so what I said was, well, that's the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> and what I meant was, uh, this is the age of fertility, right? So if you think about uh, when the intersection of a cancer diagnosis and a cancer treatment is going to have a potential life-altering effect on a patient's fertility, it's exactly in this 15 to 40 age range. Uh, this is data showing that, uh, in this case, alcohol and cigarettes, but it's true for other substances as well, that it's about age 15 where you start to see use rates go up. And actually, above age 40, use rates tend to go down. Uh, this was a look at smoking uh, in 2016. And while generally smoking is decreasing in the United States, in 2016, uh, it, it, when they surveyed patients aged 15 to 39, uh, a third of them were current smokers, which I think is a, is a surprising amount. So sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it, it turns out that if you look at rock and roll uh, as a genre by popularity, everybody loves it. There is no age cutoff. Young kids love it. Old people love it. Uh, but hip hop turns out <laughs> 15 to 40. Although I will say my Uber driver coming over was at least in his 50s, and he had hip hop going on tonight. So this might be data. I'm not sure. So yeah, the, the age of 15 to you know teens, 20s, 30s, it, it is a broad age range. But really, there's some very important developmental um, milestones that happen in this age range. And they happen for different people at different ages in that span. 
Um, if you look at Eric Erickson's uh, classic psychosocial stages of development, what you find is sort of core to these patients um, is sort of two phenomenon. One is a, what's defined as a crisis between the ego identity and role confusion, sort of who am I and what am I going to be. The main virtue being fidelity in relationship to peers, and that's sort of a defining sort of psychosocial developmental milestone for adolescents and young adults. The other is intimacy versus isolation, with the sort of the prime virtue being love and the re relationship uh, being with friends. And really, when you think about balancing the context of a cancer diagnosis in this age range of 15 to 40, for most patients, these are the sorts of things that underlie um, you know, the, the path. So lastly, um, despite the fact that 15 to 40 seems like such a big age range, uh, cancer is a diagnosis uh, uh, that increases dramatically with age. And so if you look at cancer survivors, and this graph being uh, defined at the time of diagnosis, so from day one, you're a cancer survivor. In 2019, you can see there were over 16 million cancer survivors over the age of 40 but only 680,000 in this 15 to 40-year-old uh, age range. So uh, it is, it's a unique population that, particularly when they're treated in the adult world, can often get overlooked uh, because they're a tiny sliver of cancer. Now, the, the, the last little sliver there is patients diagnosed uh, under age 15, and that's even a tenth of that. But if you think about all of the attention and resources that go into not just the, you know, the, the, the biological study and the therapy of pediatric cancer, but all the supports, it, there, there's probably a mismatch in terms of the needs that the 15 to 4 year olds have and how they often get lost in this, in this graph. So again, we got to this, uh, this survival gap. Um, and that led this big group that was convened by the Livestrong Foundation uh, and the National Cancer Institute to kind of take a look at this. Um, and they published this thing in 2006 um, called Closing the Gap, uh, Research and Care Imperatives for Adolescents and Young Adults with Cancer. And it was sort of a chance for all of us to get together and sort of brainstorm well, what's wrong here and what needs to be studied. And back then, this was sort of the highlights. Um, we need to characterize the cancers that occur in adolescent and young adulthood, both in terms of the development of the patient, but also the biology of the tumor itself. That patients who get cancer tend to get different kinds of cancer. We need to focus on education and outreach, engaging the community. We need to develop research tools um, at the time uh, if you did a medical literature search for adolescent and young adult cancer, you would find almost nothing. Uh, we had to develop standards of care. How do you approach a young patient, male or female, who uh, is diagnosed with cancer and might be prescribed a therapy that impacts their fertility? What is the standard approach? And then advocacy, um, making sure that, that that sliver wasn't lost in the adult population. So that led to an organization called the Livestrong Young Adult Alliance that actually spun off uh, and became Critical Mass, the Young Adult Alliance, uh, to take this on with sort of this core question of why might there be a survival gap for adolescents and young adults. And again, I think it kind of comes down to these four things. Uh, and I'm going to spend much of the rest of the talk kind of giving some examples of what is unique about uh, this cancer population. I'm going to show you that, that if you get cancer as an adolescent young adult, the types of cancer are often different. Then I'm going to pivot to biology and tell you that even if you have the same cancer as a child or the same cancer as an older adult, the biology can actually be quite different. Then I'm going to talk about even if you have the same cancer and the same age, the treatments that we give can differ based on sort of the site of care and context, and that that can be part of the outcome difference. And then finally, I'll touch on some of those broad developmental issues that sort of underlie um, all of the cancer care delivery for adolescents and young adults. 
So to start off with unique cancers. So the most common cancers in the United States are prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. But if you're diagnosed with cancer in the United States between the ages of 15 and 39, it's a different mix of cancers. In fact, if you're a male diagnosed with cancer in this age range, the most common type is actually a germ cell tumor of the testicle, testicular cancer, which is a rare cancer in medical oncology, but would be the most common cancer in the population that I'm focused on. You can see the other types of common cancers for young adults are hematologic malignancies like leukemias and lymphomas. You see melanomas, sarcomas, brain tumors. In females, uh, you see, again, hematologic malignancies in melanoma. You see thyroid cancer, cervical and ovarian cancer. And in both males and females, you do start to see things like GI tumors, colorectal cancers, and breast cancers. Um, at the upper age range of this adolescent and young adult. Uh, although, as I'll show you later, biologically they often act quite differently. This is a graph where each of the colored lines are different cancers uh, occurring in males uh, age 15 to, to 39. You can see there's sort of a blue one in the middle that has this big peak and then drops down. That's actually Kaposi's sarcoma in the 80s and 90s that was associated with the HIV epidemic. So in most epidemiologic studies of adolescent and young adult, we, we tend to um, put that one aside. But you can see the next top one is germ cell tumor, testicular cancer. And not only is it the most common, but the incident has more than doubled uh, since the 70s. This is the same kind of curve for females. And because breast cancer becomes quite common in the older adolescent and young adult patients, that's actually the most common AYA diagnosis in females. But just below that, you see a light blue uh, that almost reaches the breast cancer incidence by 2015, and that's thyroid carcinoma. So again, thyroid cancer, not something that people normally think of as one of the common cancers, but it's actually, if you're focused in adolescents and young adults, it's one of the more common female cancers. So as I sort of hinted at, in addition to having a unique type of cancer, each cancer often has unique biology, and that may explain some of the survival differences that were initially observed. And a lot of what has led us to think about this is basic epidemiology. So this is the age of incidence for testicular cancer in males. So I said it was the most common cancer for males. But if you look at it the other way and say, take everybody who has testicular cancer, what age were they at diagnosis? You can see that below age 15, almost no one. And above age 40, fairly rare. This is sort of a prototypic young adult cancer. There is something about the biology of germ cell tumor of the testicle that leads it really not to occur in young people and to not occur so much in older people. Really suggesting that there are biological features that are driving this cancer to be an AYA cancer. But there are other epidemiological trends that also point to different biology. So most of us think of melanoma as associated with sun exposure, UV exposure. Um, and it turns out that, that that is generally true and that the incidence of melanoma goes up dramatically with age, uh, including sort of increased time spent uh, uh, under that UV exposure. And if you were to have a melanoma, a skin cancer, in an area that's associated with UV exposure, it's going to be in parts of the skin that are exposed to the sun, like your head and neck. And so the black line of dramatically increasing incidence with age of melanoma fits that paradigm, right? However, if you look way earlier in this curve and say, well, what happens if you're diagnosed with melanoma in the age range 15 to 40, it turns out that head and neck site is not the most common primary. The most common primary is actually the trunk, which again would suggest that the biology, the mechanism of developing melanoma is probably different 
in these 15 to 40 year olds with truncal melanomas than it is in sort of the classic biology of head and neck melanoma. And again, I showed you this curve earlier of breast cancer and said, isn't it strange that if you're under the age of 40 diagnosed with breast cancer, your survival outcomes are actually worse. That would suggest that there's different biology of the breast cancer in younger women. This was actually described quite a long time ago uh, by epidemiologists. Uh, uh, Dr. Clemenson described Clemenson's hook where he graphed the incidence, the onset of breast cancer by age, and actually found what's called a bimodal distribution. Kind of goes up, and then it kind of goes down a little bit, and then goes up again, and then it goes down. And it was suggested that maybe that's actually two overlapping curves. A curve of young uh, breast cancer and another curve of slightly older breast cancer. And it turns out that if you divide breast cancer diagnosis based on whether or not it ex expresses an estrogen receptor, you find that there is a curve for estrogen receptor negative and then a separate curve for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer with different median ages. Another way to look at that is to look at the underlying cell type that undergoes the cancer transformation event, that becomes a cancer, and whether or not it's a, a basal versus a luminal cell type of breast tissue. And again, you see sort of these two different curves. There's a younger age bre basal-like breast cancer, and then an older age non-basal-like or luminal cell breast cancer. And in addition to having sort of different age of onset for these two different biologies, it turns out that that could very well explain a lot of the outcome difference because in the, the graph on the right, um, the annual hazard rate is the, is the rate of death from breast cancer. And you can see that the younger basal-like in the black has a much, much higher early incidence of death. So again, going back, to the mid-2000s when we started to investigate this problem, we were looking at these various pieces of epidemiology and say, really, there's some basic science here that we need to understand for tumors. Not just in breast cancer. Uh, this is an example in Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, there's also a bimodal age of distribution for Hodgkin lymphoma, true for males, true for females, suggesting that there's a young uh, uh, biology of, of uh, the onset of Hodgkin lymphoma and an older patient's disease. And then I showed you this curve earlier uh, with a dramatic decrease in the long-term survivorship for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, based on the age of diagnosis. So let's dig into this one. Well, to begin with, if you're diagnosed with leukemia, the type of leukemia you're diagnosed with uh, varies dramatically by age. Uh, the most common pediatric cancer is ALL. And if you're diagnosed with leukemia, far and away the light blue ALL is the most common type of cancer that you're diagnosed with if you're less than 10 years old. If you go to the older age spectrum, you see that that ALL color is a tiny little part. Uh, and you see the onset of AML, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, and chronic leukemias, including a, a leukemia called CML. So just thinking, you know, what causes leukemia, well, probably the underlying pathophysiology is different because we're seeing different types of leukemia occurring at different ages when we focus on this young adult population. So knowing that, what if we just focus on ALL again? and say, well, what do we know about the biology of the cancer cells in ALL? And one of the ways that we can go about that is to look at the chromosomes within the cancer cells. Oftentimes there's chromosomal abnormalities where they've broken or had a translocation that often uh, actually drives the, the, the biology of that cancer. And the kinds of translocations here really aren't important, but what's important is for each column of age, you see different colors. So even though all of these patients have ALL, you can see that older patients much more often have a purple abnormality, 
which happens to be called the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, versus the blue or the orange or the yellow abnormalities. So, so even though all these patients have ALL, the, the age at which you're diagnosed with ALL probably has different biology. The other thing that's important is the light blue is other. And the most common abnormality if you're 15 to 39 diagnosed with ALL in your cytogenetics, the most common is actually other. Meaning there's a whole spectrum of biology that's less understood and less studied than the ones that, that, that are already established in the other colors. And then briefly, uh, I just want to talk about a, a, a important cell paper that came out just last year looking at what's called the Cancer Genome Atlas, where um, they essentially took cancer specimens from a variety of ages and did a really uh, deep and, and, and comprehensive molecular analysis looking at the gene expression profiles of various tumors. And what they found was there's a difference based on age that um, uh, younger individuals tend to more often have um, dysregulation in, uh, in what's called a molecular aging phenotype uh, with genes turned on or turned off that are associated with premature aging, premature senescence. That younger patients more often have driver gene mutations. Um, and that older patients tend to have less genes turned on that have to do with immune infiltration or immune function, whereas younger patients, the sort of immune milieu around the tumor in the, in the molecular pattern really more resembles healthy tissue. So all of this is to say there's probably very specific biological features that are different based on age uh, in, uh, the, uh, in both the, the cancer cells themselves and the milieu around the cancer. And I'm going to kind of, for the sake of time, skip a couple of slides that, that explain exactly that. Okay. So we talked about different cancers. We talked about different biologies in the cancer. What do we know about treating adolescents and young adults with cancer? So again, early days, this is 2008, uh, a leukemia doc uh, did an analysis looking at the event-free survival and overall survival of patients diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. And uh, she looked at all patients who were between the ages of 15 and 20 and asked if they were treated on a clinical trial, were they treated in the CCG, the children's cancer group, which is currently called the children's oncology group, the pediatric uh, research group, or were they treated uh, uh, on an adult regimen, an adult clinical trial uh, that was run by a group called the CLGB. And what you can see here is that the difference in survival curves between the black and the gray is really dramatic. Uh, even though all these patients are the same age, age range, 15 to 20, and all these patients have the same disease, ALL, if you were treated in the adult cancer clinical trial, your seven-year rent-free survival was 34%. But if you were treated on the children's cancer group trial, your seven-year rent-free survival was almost double. It was 63%. So that would suggest that there's something very different about the chemotherapy regimens that are being studied in the pediatric world versus the adult world. Um, and I probably should have said earlier, I'm an adult trained oncologist, so I can, I can pick on adults uh, trained oncologists uh, treating ALL because I'm one of them. So this observation was really profound and led a group of, again, adult oncologists to say, well, wait a minute. What if we took a look at young patients, this 15 to 39 year old age range, and we actually treated them as if they were a child? What if we gave them the pediatric regimen? Knowing that the pediatric regimen was totally different cocktail, different drugs, different doses of drugs, different intensity of drugs. Um, Let's just replicate exactly one of these children's oncology group trials in older patients. So that was done across the United States, median age of 24, 295 patients. And what they found was an event-free survival that was 
53%, or uh, sorry, 59%. Um, so remember I said before it went from uh, 34 to 63. Here we're at 59 by giving pediatric therapy to an uh, adolescent and, uh, and young adult population, uh, suggesting that these patients are going to do better with a pediatric regimen. And in fact, in most leukemia centers across the country, this has become the standard of care for young adults diagnosed with ALL is to use a pediatric inspired regimen. I can tell you that when we first started doing this, we were really worried because the regimen is quite different. Um, and even the, the side effect, the tolerance of side effects is different. As an adult oncologist, if, if a patient came in for their next cycle of chemotherapy and their liver function tests were 10 times above the upper limit of normal, I would not have given them the next dose of chemo. I would have said, well, we need to hold that their liver normalize, uh, come back next week. But on this protocol, many times you would go ahead even up to 20 times normal. So built into the trial was a, was a look at, well, what's the toxicity of this regimen? And what this shows is in blue, uh, the 15 to 39 year olds treated with a pediatric regimen. And in red, young children treated in uh, pediatric centers with a children's oncology group regimen. And really all I mean, mean to show you is there is a difference. Uh, the rate of adverse events or, or toxicities, whether it's liver function tests, febrile neutropenia, uh, other liver function abnormalities, pancreatitis, the incidence of these things is different. So it's, it's not like, oh, these are just kids give a 35-year-old the five-year-old regimen, it's all going to be fine. Uh, there is a nuance here. Um, and I think calls for the, you know, so, sort of supports the idea of having this field of adolescent and young adult oncology where there's a group of us who really focus on this age range and become familiar with what happens to these patients. The other uh, really important finding was um, that despite the fact that these patients were all treated on a research protocol where it tells you exactly what to do and what not to do and when to hold the drug and when not to hold the drug, obviously any physician in front of their patient makes a clinical judgment. Should we, should we continue this therapy or should we not? Should we skip this dose or should we not? Also, uh, uh, each patient and their family is going to decide to come to their clinic, come to their next appointment, et cetera. And so one of the things that was really important was the rate at which patients actually com completed all of the planned therapy. So in the trial that I showed you of young adults, that rate was only 39%. Um, at the same time, in the children's oncology group, when they did their study, it was much, much higher. And they published results showing not only was it higher, but they broke it down into kids less than 18 or patients treated in the children's group but older than 18. And you can see it was 74% completed everything if they were under 18. In the pediatric hands, it was 57% even if they were older, older than 18, but in the adult world it was only 39%. That's really important because this is a study of ALL looking at adherence to one of the maintenance medicines called mecaptopurine. This is an oral pill. So instead of having someone come into the clinic and watching it go into their IV, you're sending a person home with a bottle of pills and hoping that they take it every day. Well, it turns out that the cutoff between, um, sh be between uh, uh, having statistically significant increase in relapse is actually 95%. You need to take 95% of the doses of this oral cancer drug to not experience an increase in relapse rate. So that's pretty high. If you think about any of us taking medicines, it's kind of hard to hit 95%. It's really important. So I talked a little bit about, you know, hey, maybe we should be treating, at least in ALL, we should be treating older young adults with pediatric regimens, but let me show you this curve because it looks kind of similar to the one I showed you for ALL, 
But this is not ALL, this is Ewing sarcoma. So sarcoma being another common young adult cancer, but rare cancer. It is similar in that you see two different survival curves, the blue one being almost double the survival of the red curve. It's similar in that all the patients that you're looking at were between the ages of 15 and 20 when they were diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. The difference though is every patient on this uh, graph was enrolled in the same trial. So they had exactly the same treatment regimen, exactly the same rules about what to give and what not to give, when to hold, when not to hold. The only difference was whether the patient was treated in a children's hospital, a pediatric institution, or an adult hospital, what's called a medical institution. And you can see that the survival curve is dramatically different. So as an adult oncologist, I get defensive and I think, well, what's going on here? Why would the pediatricians be doing so much better? But then I start reflecting on, well, the environment is totally different, right? If a, if a seven-year-old doesn't come for their chemotherapy treatment, you probably call Child Protective Services and figure out where the heck that kid is. But if a 27-year-old doesn't, you probably say, geez, he's flaking again, you know. Uh, it's just a different approach. The, the ratio of physicians, nurses, social workers, the ratio of those providers per patient is dramatically different in a children's hospital than an adult hospital. So the support to make sure that patients are, are getting cared for, not just in terms of prescribing the drugs, but everything else that they need to adhere to their therapy, the, the support system is very different. So these sorts of things led us to say, you know, probably the environment that we're treating patients is quite different as well and has led places, including the Norton, to create really specialized units focused for adolescents and young adults. The other is sort of expertise in these rare tumors. So ALL is a rare tumor, especially in the adult world. And this national database took a look at 22,000 patients with ALL who were diagnosed under the age of 40 and said, Take a look at all these different variants that might be associated with a poor outcome, like their income, their, uh, whether or not they have government or no insurance, um, whether they were non-white, all of these factors. But when you put all those things in a multivariate analysis, the single most important factor was how far you lived from the cancer center. If the patient lived more than 50 miles from the cancer center, their ALL outcome was worse. Now it turns out in that database they did the same thing for acute myeloid leukemia who I would argue the treatment is not as foreign to an adult oncologist and not as complicated. Um, they didn't find that distance had such an important thing, important effect. But for something as specialized as ALL, really getting to a specialized center is critically important. Okay. Unique cancers, unique biology, unique treatment issues. What about the rest of the patient? So uh, this guy has his name right on his hat. He doesn't hide the fact that he was diagnosed with testicular cancer when he was 24. Uh, as you can see from the photo, he's a pretty active and healthy guy at the time. He was an Olympic swimmer. Uh, he had no steady finances. He had months and months of symptoms until his girlfriend said, you know, you really need to go to a doctor. He did and described this testicular pain and swelling and it turns out that he had, not surprisingly as a 24 year old, a testicular tumor, a germ cell tumor of the testis. Uh, but his story was made famous because this was about two and a half weeks before the Olympics. And he, in consult with his doctor, uh, uh, delayed the start of his therapy so that he could go compete in the breaststroke, which he won a medal in compete with Michael Phelps in the relay, which he won the gold medal in, uh, and then go back and have his testicular cancer therapy, uh, which he did well with. This is another patient of mine, another 24-year-old athlete, active, healthy, his, his sport is rodeo. Uh, uh, turns out you don't make much money in the rodeo. <laughs> you certainly don't if you don't win the event that night. He also had months and months of symptoms. But his symptoms were in his chest. He had a nagging cough. And he coughed and he coughed and he coughed so much that finally he started going to little small town emergency rooms 
and getting antibiotics and more antibiotics and more antibiotics and months and months later somebody said you know I know you're a young healthy guy but maybe we should do a chest x-ray and it turns out he had a very large mediastinal mass, a mass under his breastbone in his chest and when you biopsied it it was germ cell tumor if you looked under the microscope, you wouldn't know the difference between the first guy's testicular cancer and this guy's mediastinal germ cell tumor. They were both germ cell tumors. But it turns out that the biology is different and the response rates to chemotherapy are, is really dramatically different. And I met this patient because he got chemotherapy but didn't respond and he ended up coming to our institution for bone marrow transplant, uh, which thankfully worked and he went back to the rodeo. So I bring up these cases because you just start thinking about well, what would it mean to be diagnosed with cancer when you're 24? I just gave you two good stories of delay in diagnosis of a rare tumor whose biology is not well understood. These are both patients who had an extreme desire to maintain their physical activity uh, even to the expense of delaying therapy. Both of these guys were on the road doing their sport and had to move back in with their parents at age 24, which you might choose to do at age 24. We were talking about that earlier because, you know, I've got a 20-something year old kid too. Uh, but these people didn't choose to. They were forced to move back with their parents and weren't necessarily happy about that. Uh, they had to think about their finances. They had to think about whether or not they had insurance and how to get insurance. These guys, like many people this age, have no direct experience with cancer. They've never had a friend or colleague, peer, go through cancer. In fact, I think only one of these guys had a distant uncle who'd ever had cancer. Uh, neither of these guys had ever thought about fertility. One of them actually had a, a pretty serious girlfriend at the time. And all of a sudden, here we are talking about sperm banking. He has to decide, like, do I talk to this girlfriend? I'm not sure if we're made to you know, have kids in the future. It's pretty awkward all kinds of issues around the cancer diagnosis. So I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights of, of, of I think, interesting snippets about these issues. Uh, and I'm going to start with insurance. So this was a study done across the United States of adolescents and young adults. Um, and I pulled out this data uh, among patients who actually had insurance. Okay, so adolescent young adult diagnosed with cancer has insurance. And they asked, how many times did your provider prescribe some test or treatment that your insurance didn't cover? And the answer was about 20% of the time. So then they said, okay, of those 20%, let's take a look at those tests and procedures. How many times did you get that test and procedure anyway? Because your doctor said you should. And not surprisingly, it was 80% of the time, right? If you're diagnosed with cancer and your provider says you need X, you're probably going to try to do it. But what this means is that even patients with insurance are at risk for financial toxicity of cancer. And a young person probably doesn't have the savings and backup to, to manage this and are often sort of saddled with that financial toxicity for a very long time. Fertility. Fertility is sort of a defining feature of adolescent and young adult life. And so it is a defining feature of the field of adolescent and young adult oncology. In our major professional society, ASCO, many years ago published a clinical practice guideline saying that, that talking about fertility uh, uh, and having it be part of the informed consent before starting cancer therapy is really uh, a, a, a fundamental guideline. But it turns out that, that um, the impact that a cancer therapy might have on someone's future fertility uh, can really weigh on a patient diagnosed with cancer. And in fact, they may elect a different therapy all in the name of preserving their fertility. Uh, in one study, 29% of females with breast cancer said that the risk of infertility directly influenced their treatment decision. Um, if you look at, uh, at, at different surveys of patients and say, did your doctor ever talk to you about fertility before they started therapy? The, the rates, even today, are still unfortunately low. Um, many of, uh, of, of uh, cancer providers don't bring it up. And why might that be? Well, 
Oftentimes the patient themselves is pretty overwhelmed and they're focused with the cancer diagnosis. Um, they may not be aware of potential fertility loss with cancer therapy if their doctor uh, or nurse doesn't bring it up. Uh, but sometimes there are real practical things like there's a concern about a treatment delay. We, we don't have time to do, you know, egg maturation with several weeks of hormones and, and things like that. We need to start leukemia treatment in the next 24 hours. State by state, um, there has been an effort to um, enact legislation to require people who sell insurance in the state to provide for fertility preservation costs when patients are diagnosed with cancer. Um, there's often a loophole that even in patients who have insurance that covers infertility treatments, by definition, these patients aren't actually infertile. They're just diagnosed with cancer. Like if they could have a child that day, they're not infertile, but we're gonna make them infertile, and therefore we would like to, to use the same techniques for fertility preservation. So it turns out that I looked and Kentucky is one of the states where this is actually uh, a house bill in committee right now uh, with the title, uh, an act relating to the coverage of uh, medical services. It's to create, uh, require health insurance coverage for fertility preservation services and medical services related to testicular and other urological cancers, et cetera, et cetera. Another fear about fertility is um, in hormonal cancers like breast cancer, um, is it safe? Can we give a woman hormones to mature eggs to allow for fertility preservation? Will that drive the breast cancer and lead to worse breast cancer outcomes? And the three different colored lines here overlapping, this data shows that there is no increased risk uh, to fertility preservation in breast cancer patients. And then finally, I think a really controversial thing right now, but I think it's important to bring up, is um, pregnancy and cancer. So it, it turns out that about one in a thousand women uh, of this age range, uh, sorry, one in a thousand women in the United States diagnosed with cancer, so it includes ages a little bit higher than 39, one in a thousand have cancer at the time that they become pregnant. Um, which doesn't sound really high, but that means that there's a lot of patients who are gonna come to our clinic who have cancer and pregnancy at the same time. Um, and that creates a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, everything from the diagnostics, the way to safely do biopsies, the imaging technologies that we can or can't use, the surgical techniques that uh, are safe or not safe, as well as obviously the therapies. Uh, th there are certain therapies that we know will have dramatically adverse effects on a fetus. So this is a really hot topic right now of, you know, how do we manage pregnancy? Um, but I just want to bring it to everyone's attention that as a young adult oncologist, I'm often faced with sort of the medical side of how difficult these, these situations are and, and that really each situation um, requires a lot of sensitivity. I will point out that um, because this is such an important issue, uh, there's a very large epidemiologic study going on looking at pregnancy outcomes after the diagnosis of the most common cancers that occur in young adult women. Uh, and this is a case control study where they take a look at pregnancy outcomes in patients who don't have cancer as well as patients who do have cancer, uh, looking at two very large uh, insurance databases of tens of thousands of patients. So we should learn more and more about pregnancy outcomes in cancer in the future. Other things that are unique to young adult cancers, um, even in patients who survive their cancer, they can have all kinds of long-term complications. And I'll give just a couple quick examples. One is a second cancer. So sometimes the therapies that we use for cancer or something about the patient's underlying biology itself can put them at risk for a second cancer. And what you see here is um, that the rate, the cumulative incidence of secondary cancers 
uh, can hit as high as 20% in the adolescent and young adult population if you go out long enough, if you go out 30, 35 years. But again, in the patient population I'm talking about, we hope these survivors are going to be living 30 to 35 years. Another is cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease is a risk for all of us, but it turns out that if you look at young adult survivors of, of cancer, that their uh, cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease can be more than double that of their peers who didn't have cancer. And then finally, transitions. Oftentimes, a uh, young adult might start their therapy in a pediatric world, but kind of age out. Um, and it turns out that um, pediatricians often will try to hold on to patients for as long as seems reasonable. Uh, so this is a survey looking at pediatric oncologists, and 96% of them said that they would take care of a patient up to age 21. Almost half said up to age 25. Uh, even 16% said they'd take care of a patient up to age 30. Um, but at some point, there needs to be a transition for these patients who are at risk of secondary cancers or heart early heart disease and things. Um, and those transitions are often very hard. Uh, there's not usually standardized tools for how to do that. That is a current initiative in adolescent and young adult oncology. Um, and even when you have the tools, there's a lot of barriers. Um, you really bond to a patient, um, taking them through cancer, and, and, and oftentimes think that, uh, uh, that their, their best care is to stick with the pediatrician. All right. So I kind of talked about unique cancers, unique biology, unique therapy issues, uh, the context of being a young adult. I'm going to sort of wrap up with some of these national efforts uh, that are been going and are, and are underway now. Uh, the Institute of Medicine. The Institute of Medicine is a, um, is a government funded entity, uh, part of the National Academies of, um, of Science, uh, that uh, convened a workshop in 2015 identifying and addressing the needs of adolescents and young adults with cancer, looking at all of these issues that we touched on. For providers in the room, uh, you're probably familiar with something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN. This is a sort of a go-to resource for many oncologists, including many sort of uh, uh, private practice oncologists as sort of the go-to guide. How do I do this? How do I do that? They have published guidelines for adolescent and young adult oncology, the latest update just being last month. Enrollment in clinical trials is really important. So the National Cancer Institute has a mechanism called the National Clinical Trials Network, NCTN, who's had specific initiatives to increase the enrollment of adolescent and young adults on clinical trial. Um, that started at that black dotted line. And uh, if you look at the, the, the curve B, the percentage of enrolled patients, the red is increasing over time. So we are proportionally enrolling more adolescents and young adults on clinical trials than ever before. Even the pandemic, when you think about everything that we had to pivot to around uh, technology and virtual medicine, that could be quite useful for these rare tumors in patients who live more than 50 miles from the cancer center. Everything from telemedicine to sort of virtual expert review um, and remote monitoring. Finally, uh, within the National Clinical Trials Network, there's a new task force uh, aimed at uh, studying what are called patient reported outcomes, PRO, which is essentially a fancy way to survey patients about what actually matters to them as they're, we're looking at outcomes. Obvi often oncologists focus very much on the survival rates, but there are a lot of other very important outcomes that uh, we want patients to report on. The FDA. So in 2019, the FDA published this, considerations for the inclusion of adolescent patients in adult oncology clinical trials. So most, adult, most uh, clinical trials uh, that the FDA uh, sponsors are in adults, not children. Um, uh, and, and the FDA approval process is very different. 
And so as a first step to address that, this is guidance on how you might lower the age to allow younger patients onto adult FDA trials. And then finally, I mentioned before the Livestrong Young Adults Alliance and Critical Mass. Uh, that is now evolving into a new group called the AYA Cancer Alliance. Dr. Flynn is actually helping advise this group and their first national kickoff is this summer, uh, which again is a mechanism to bring uh, the sort of providers and healthcare professionals in the hospital together with patients and patient advocate groups to continue to tackle this. So I started with this, five-year relative survival was flat. Then I told you in 2006, we all got together and said, let's do something about it. And then at the time, if you searched in the medical literature for young adult cancer, you found almost nothing. That's the orange arrow, 2006 is when we started. And you can see that there's been a dramatic increase in the publications around young adult cancer. So we've made an impact. And this graph I just pulled from the actual national database, SEER database, so it doesn't, doesn't look super impressive, but what I want to show you is that the orange, 15 to 39, is on top. And this is looking at this five-year survival rate. And between the year 2000 and 2014, we've made improvements. So that's what I brought. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the, the, the question was really about sort of what are people doing around the country to, uh, to address things like fertility preservation or, or sort of awareness of some of these issues. Um, and, and I can tell you that um, there's been, it's been a multifaceted approach. Um, but at our institution, one of the things that we did was pretty simple. We created a policy in about 2006, 2007, where we said every patient of reproductive age who's diagnosed with cancer must be educated on the impacts that cancer and the cancer therapy is gonna have on their potential future fertility. We didn't say you had to do anything about it, we just said you must have the conversation. Um, and then, knowing that many of my peers didn't know the data, were not uncomfortable, we started an AYA program where we offered a consult to say, hey, <laughs> You don't have to learn all this stuff. You don't have to be the expert in fertility. How about every young adult patient that's diagnosed in your clinic, you send to us for a consult. And we'll talk to them about fertility. But when we do that, we'll also talk to them about financial toxicity. We'll also introduce them to a whole range of psychosocial services that exist. You know, we'll also make sure that there's not a clinical trial somewhere at this institution that you hadn't thought of. Um, so that model of sort of creating AYA programs to do it, I think has had the biggest impact. Um, and sufficient impact that uh, organizations like Teen Cancer America have financially supported institutions like your own to, to sort of support and develop those AYA programs. Doctor, uh, my name is George Lehman. I came this evening because I lost a dearly departed son to AML after an eight-year battle. And it became eminently clear, even though I'm a lay person, I'm not a medical person, it became eminently clear that page after page that you put on that screen were issues for young adults from fertility, um, finances, insurance, over and over again. And so I don't have a question so much as I want to thank you and Norton's for taking this on because our whole family recognized that these young adults, especially teenagers, fell in kind of a donut hole, as Medicare would say. And so you had to navigate those things so much on your own, it seemed. So the fact that you and Norton's and other institutions would recognize this and try to do something about it because it's... Uh, it's one thing to have cancer and try to navigate that, 
so much of these issues were just unrecognized, or at least um, not um, uh, not addressed. And so the fact that you would address this and take it on, and the fact that Norton's would recognize that these are different patients with different outcomes, with different treatments, uh, different biology, and so forth, is uh, just uh, I'm very grateful that you're all doing that. Thank you very much. Well, well, thanks, thanks for sharing that. I think um, I, I think um, kind of reflecting Dr. Flynn's question, like the the magnitude of this challenge is big, um, and, and the field, while I'm sort of promoting the fact that we've made some progress, this is still a young field in oncology. Um, and so, frankly, I, I applaud the organizers and the Garla family for bringing this up as a topic because I think the way we're going to continue to advance this field is to engage the widest group of people we can who care about these issues. So thanks for being here. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Yarin. The increase in cardiovascular effect that you mentioned in this group, is it related to the uh, treatment or is it related to the disease or both, number one. Number two, is Hodgkin lymphoma also part of it? Yeah, so uh, the, the answer is probably both, um, but there are some very specific treatment related uh, factors um, uh, that can be quite impactful and actually Hodgkin's is a great example where uh, radiation, so Hodgkin's is a, is a kind of lymphoma and it uh, very commonly occurs in the chest. And uh, uh, it's actually one of the cancers for which back in the 70s and 80s when the young adult survival rate was high, it was high because of cancers like Hodgkin's where we had very effective therapies. But part of that therapy was radiating the chest. And it turns out that one of the major toxicities of that kind of central chest radiation is exactly that, is, is a dramatic increase in cardiovascular risk. So much so that the field has, has evolved to not routinely using radiation to the center of the chest for Hodgkin's because we've developed so many other great curative therapies for Hodgkin's. So that's, Hodgkin's is part of that story. Um, but there are many other, uh, uh, you know, therapy exposures that increase risk, um, uh, I including um, increasing, you know, what's called the metabolic syndrome. So, you know, changes in cholesterol, changes in blood pressure, changes in body mass index, things like that, uh, that are long-term associated with cardiovascular risk. So it may not be a direct effect of the heart, like radiation, but but um, you know things like steroids and other chemotherapies can have those effects. One other question, if there is one. Thank you. So don't go anywhere. Oh, oh. Don't go anywhere. Well, thanks. So first, uh, I, I, I know it's going to be hard for many. Of you. I made a mistake at the beginning. Let's give a round of applause to Elliot. And this, 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 uh, <laughs> I was so caught up in things. But sorry, I got that. That wrong. I, I do want to. I told you it would be incredible. This is really um, Dr. Hayes Latin is is really a thought leader in this field, as you can tell, and really thrilled that he was here. So we're going to give a little memento Thank of you being so here. Much. So that's for you. And well, Lauren will send it back to you. You don't have to carry it in the airplane <laughs> and break it, but. Um, I just want to thank him again for being here, and thank you for the Garla family for, again, sponsoring it, and thank you all for coming tonight. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>